the book of Acts. The book of Acts written by Luke. Luke was a companion of the Apostle Paul. He's also the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Luke was not Jewish. He was Gentile, which makes, which makes that quite astounding in and of itself. But in, Luke, or in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is saying to his disciples when they asked him, are you going to set up your kingdom now? They'd seen him die. They'd seen the resurrection. They'd seen everything that went on, and it was a very logical question. Is now the time you're going to set up your kingdom? And uh, somewhat politely, Jesus said, that's none of your business. What is your business is this. You're going to be my witnesses, and you're going to do this in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Now, the first nine chapters of the book of Acts covers that. Jerusalem, Judea, all, all Judea, and Samaria. So the first three places in that outline have been done. Now we're going to get to and then to the uttermost parts of the world. Because now the gospel is going to jump the banks of Judaism, I mean really jump the banks, and get to the Gentile world. And then finally, if that doesn't seem important to you, to you and I. And so it, it's an important chapter as far as that process and in the outline of the book of Acts. So put it this way, the gospel, that is the proclamation that God is for us that God has made a way for us to reestablish a lost relationship with him, that we are loved by God, and even though we have rebelled from him, he stands ready to forgive us by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and, and give us this thing called that the New Testament calls eternal life. And if you've heard me before, you've heard me say that that word life in the New Testament is the word Zoe every time it talks about the life that God has that he gives to us as a free gift. It's a different word from other forms of life. The kind of life we pass on to our kids, for example, is called suke life. Zoe life is something God possesses, and only he can give away. And every time the New Testament describes that, it uses that word. And that's the gift of, of, of life that we have, etern we call eternal life. That's the gospel. The gospel is not a discussion, really, and it's not really a debate. It is simply a proclamation to be accepted or rejected. And, and that, that's clear from the New Testament. Now this proclamation is going to go out not just to Jewish people, as it has been primarily, but now it's, it, it, it's going to become clear that this message is for everyone. And Peter, a very Jewish individual, is going to get the message here in chapter 10 because he's going to have to deliver it to a Gentile man. The world has a lot of religions, but there's really only one gospel. And we're going to see how God makes sure that it spreads. So uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, follow along. If not, it's in, uh, it's in your bulletins, or it'll be up here on the screen. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Okay, here's the point today. This pivotal event, in the book of Acts, demonstrates that the gospel is truly for all nations and for all peoples. Now, that doesn't sound all of that big to us, who have been used to this now for 2,000 years. In the first century, it was a big deal. And, and I, don't, I don't think we can, I, I think it's impossible for us to understand how big of a deal this was, going from Jewish to Gentile. And so th this chapter is really important. First point is this. And it's a very simple point, and it, this isn't something you're going to grab and, and, and get all warm and fuzzy. But I need to talk to your head for a little bit here, all right? I need to, I need to do the setting. I need, to, I need sure you understand where this took place because it's important. Caesarea was the seat of the Roman administration 
in Israel. So verse, cha- verse 1 of chapter 10 says this, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known of the Italian cohort. Now, a couple years ago I had a chance to go to Israel class. Now, I, w- I asked for a laser pointer, and they gave me this. <laughs> Apparently, laser pointers disappear on these kind of screens, according to Kevin Grubb. So uh, I will be going off camera here, too, I think, for a while. So we're going we're gonna to look at Caesarea for a little bit. Now, a little plug, too. Uh, in maybe April, early May of 2017, I'd like to lead a trip to Israel. So if you'd like to go, see me. I, I have some. We're, we, we were going to try to go next spring, but we're going to do it in 2017. But I was able to go a couple years ago. My brother, who's a pastor in Walnut Creek, uh, uh, had pity on his poor brother and uh, and took me. And so got to do this. Now, you ready? Okay, you guys with me? All right, good. Here's Jerusalem right there. They told me not to hit the TV. All right, there's Caesarea is up here. Okay, Joppa's here, so it's about, uh, it, even though it looks further, it's about 70 miles from Jerusalem to Caesarea and about 30 miles from Joppa to Caesarea. That's where Peter was hanging out in Joppa, and that's where, that's where uh, Cornelius ends up sending these guys. All right, now, next slide. Here's what Caesarea looks like today, class. Now, actually, it's quite beautiful, all right, because it's right on, it's right on the shore. Caesarea was where the Romans hung out in Israel. It was the seat of the Roman government in Israel. And so that's why guys like Cornelius, a centurion, was there in Caesarea. And it's got some things. There's an amphitheater here. All of this was built by Herod the Great, by the way. This is the same Herod the Great that killed all the babies after Jesus was born. He's a very bad man, but he was an, an incredible builder. When you go to Israel, he's, everything there, you've got Herod the Great's fingerprints on it. And so... This, this city, especially, it was given him by Caesar. By, you would recognize from the word Caesarea. It comes from Caesar, so it was done in his honor. And, and so this amphitheater that Herod built, there was this big palace called the Promontory Palace. There's a place uh, in this palace where the Apostle Paul, after he was arrested, gave his defense. There's a big hippodrome there where they had chariot races. Uh, there's a temple to, to uh, Caesar over here. The most important part of it was this harbor that was built by Herod as well. Now, there was a harbor at Joppa, but he wanted to build a harbor there because, frankly, the people at Joppa didn't like him that much, and Mark Anthony, and he was honoring Caesar. And so he built this there. It was an incredible harbor uh, that he built there. It, 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 it really gave Caesarea its, its, uh, its name. There was also an aqueduct that was feeding Caesarea too. All right, next slide. Um, this one, okay, that's kind of an aerial view of what it looks like. Not as nice today as it was in the first century, but it's still pretty cool. So that's the ruins. The theater held 15,000. There's where the palace would have been. For see, there's the hippodrome. And here's what's left of the harbor um, that, that, uh, that Herod the Great uh, drew. Okay, next. This is, today is what the amphitheater looks like. It actually holds more than 15,000 today. They've restored it. Okay, next. This is uh, just some of the ruins going up to the Hippodrome. Harbor is back here. Okay, next. Uh, this is the Hippodrome. Next. This is uh, would have been a pool at that Promontory Palace. So, I mean, Herod liked to hang out. He was upscale. And, and he's also the one that built Masada. Uh, had a palace up there, too. Okay, next. This is the actual spot. And on the side of the palace, the Apostle Paul probably stood to give his defense after he was arrested and, and left in Caesarea for about two years before he actually eventually went to Rome to make his defense there. All right, next. This is an inscription. This is really important uh, because there's a word here in Latin, and it's uh, right here, Pilatus. Guess who that might refer to? Pilate. Up until 1960, there was no references to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, uh, uh, except for in the Bible and and a couple other other manuscripts. Therefore, a lot of scholars actually wondered if Pilate really ever existed. This is proof positive that he did. The Romans, again, their government was in Caesarea, and that inscription was actually found when they started to do some some, uh, tearing apart of some things. That was actually, a, that inscription was used, that stone was used to build something else. And as they 
kind of took it apart, that stone was found, and it was an inscription. Basically, it says, Pilate was here. Um, he was actually honoring Caesar, so it was one of, those, one of those kind of things. I think that's it, isn't it? All right, okay. So that, that's Caesarea. Now, why did I do all that? Well, to, again, to give you an idea that when the Bible talks about these are real places, real people hung out here, when, 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 Acts, when Luke describes these events, Caesarea was not a Jewish place, even though it was in Israel. It is where it was the seat of Roman power and authority. They wanted to stay away from Jerusalem, kind of, to, to kind of leave the Jews with that because there was always uprisings. Now, in 66 A.D., this is about 30 years after the time we're talking about now, 66, there was a revolt there by the Jews because the Romans started to come down heavy. They sent in, they sent in statues and things like that to Jerusalem. They desecrated some synagogues of Jewish people, took away their rights in Caesarea. And the revolt that started and ended in the destruction of Jerusalem, destruction of the temple, the Romans coming in and just pretty much wiping everything out, which led to Masada, where the, the remaining uh, Jewish fighters went up to that hillside and all committed suicide rather than be taken by the Romans. That happened there. And Caesarea was a place that was the start of that revolt. It is an important city related to New Testament understanding. And that's where everything is going to happen here in this, in this place of Roman occupation, really, uh, in Israel. It's, it's important to that. In terms of how it's mentioned in Acts, it's mentioned briefly in Acts 8.40 as a place where Philip went to after the experience with the Ethiopian eunuch. Again, we want to thank Charles for describing what a eunuch was to us in that sermon. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, where Paul was taken when his life was threatened in Jerusalem before he sailed on to, to his hometown in Tarsus. That's where Paul left from. It's the main location here in chapter 10. It's a place uh, later on in Acts chapter 12 where another Herod, the grandson of Herod the Great, whose name was Herod Agrippa I, died there in a very ugly way. After giving this remarkable speech, everybody was praising him and it said worms. Kind of, so he got something and, and he died in, in that amphitheater. Uh, in Acts chapter 18, Paul was there briefly following a second missionary journey. In Acts chapter 21, Paul is there for quite a while, and then 23 through 24. The whole point of this is that is to show that Caesarea, although within the confines of, of Israel, was really a Gentile-dominated city. It's the jumping off point for the last part of the book of Acts where the gospel begins going to the ends of the earth. And it starts here in Caesarea with an important Gentile leader named Cornelius. Eventually, the gospel would end up in Rome in a way that nobody would expect Paul in chains going to Rome. So it starts here. So you need to, again, understand... And I, 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 by the way, on our trip, we went to Springfield, Illinois, because I'm a Lincoln fan. And, and so I've been reading a, an awful lot now about slavery in our country and, and the divides between black and white that was going on there. Well, imagine the worst, you know, frankly, the, the worst form of bigotry in this country. And I think you can superimpose that onto what was going on in Israel in, time, in terms of how the Jewish people felt about the Gentile people at the time, and as Christianity got its start in Judaism because Jesus was Jewish and it was offered there, uh, the, the, the ethnic lines, and we saw that earlier with even among Jews, Hellenist Jews and Hebra Hebraic Jews. Unfortunately, this, this, thing's been, this ethnic stuff's been going on a long time, and the point was that the gospel was intended to break down those barriers, and Paul says it in Ephesians. And it has done so with some success over the years. But unfortunately, humans always get in the way of what God intends. And we've used the gospel in lots of ways that God never intended. But right here it's very clear. The gospel is intended for everyone. In this sense, all men are created equal. All women are created equal in terms of God wanting them to have access to this great proclamation. And so now it's going gonna, it's gonna to jump the boundaries of Judaism and go to Gentiles. Okay. Cornelius. Let's look at him. Cornelius was a man who had responded to the light that he had. He's a fascinating, really uh, uh, an odd person, uh, as, it, as it turns out. At Caesarea, verse 1, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man 
who feared God with all of his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. So now i got a picture of Cornelius here, I think. Uh, you're all thinking elementary school now, aren't you? I know what you're thinking. Okay, th- th- this is what an Italian, or a, a, this is what a, a Roman centurion would have worn. Okay, not all the time, but you know when they went to battle, except they wouldn't have that really cool thing when they went to battle. That was just to impress people as they were walking down the street. But when you think Cornelius, that, that would have been his uniform. Um, and that's kind of how he would have dressed during the day. So that's Cornelius. So let's unpack this. Does that look Jewish to you? Not really. All right, so that, that's who he was. And by the way, that, you know, having a, a Roman soldier, look, that, to a Jewish person at the time, I mean, you may as well, you may as well have been a Jewish person in Berlin with, uh, with swastikas all around. That's kind of how that would have looked to a Jewish person in the first century in terms of oppression, in terms of fearing it, and maybe not quite as bad, but it did get almost as bad. And so Roman centurions dressed like that were frankly no friends of Jewish people, but Cornelius was different. Cornelius, living in Caesarea, has al- was also living around a lot of Jewish individuals, and he began, he began to accept this God that they were talking about and worshiping. He was a god So Let's look at the way he's described a little bit. Uh, he was a military guy. First of all, we need to understand that. He was... How many military do we have here? Military or ex-military? Thank you so much for serving our country, guys, <laughs> men and women. Being a centurion, he would have been put in charge of 100 men. His unit would have been part of a larger unit, a cohort, which is made up of 600 men, which itself would have been part of a legion of 6,000, roughly, individuals. Cornel- By the way, they did, they did some aqueduct building here, and it's very likely that Cornelius and his crowd helped build the aqueducts that were coming into to Caesarea. He would have served under a, a guy named a tribune who would have been the leader of the cohort. His particular cohort had a name. It was called what in this passage? Part of the Italian cohort. Hey, what's the matter with you? Okay, that's that. He was an Italian cohort. Now, why does it point that out? It points that out. Because that means these guys serving with Cornelius would have been Roman, okay, coming from, from the, the land of Italy, not from the other provinces around. And so they, they, were, they were, in a sense, special that way. Um, this indicates that, again, most of these guys, were, they all had to be Roman citizens, but they were born in and around Rome. Uh, and, and so that, that's what, that was the, what he did, okay? Now, Luke gives four descriptions of Cornelius in this passage. First one being that he was, what's the first one? Look in your passage. He was, what kind of a man? A devout. What in the world does that mean? All right, devout. Class. What, what is it? Devoted to what? To God. All right, he, devout. In other words, his lifestyle you would have noticed by just simply looking at what Cornelius did that God was important to him in what what he did. He was devout in that way. It means that he he has a a, a deep respect for God. And he's not talking about the Roman gods here. We're talking about the Jewish God, Yahweh. Roman centurions just didn't do this. this. This was something that was no doubt risky to Cornelius. Of course, the Jewish the Jewish people would have loved this because here's somebody in power embracing their religion and probably cutting them some slack when no one else was. And so there was an influence going on here. Cornelius showed some bravery here by, by adopting, by being devout. His devotion shows itself in what he did. He gave alms. And again, the alms were probably given uh, in the synagogue for the poor people of the area. Uh, and it's mentioned here. He also fears God. Now, this, this is more than just a description. This is actually a technical term. And what it means is this, that Cornelius was a Gentile individual who had embraced Judaism, therefore a God-fearer, Yahweh-fearer. He, he had not become fully Jewish yet. In other words, he hadn't, he hadn't gone through the magic knife 
say, to be circumcised, but he was in every way, in terms of his practice, a Jewish religious person. He was a God-fearer. That's, that's the, the term that was given to Gentiles who were embracing Judaism, and that's what Cornelius is described as. He is, he is unique. He's, he's rare. Somebody, a, a, a Roman centurion in Roman country here, embracing Judaism. Could not have been an easy thing for him to do. He gave alms, as I said, as I said earlier, and he prays. And he prays. And he led his entire household on this. That to me is impressive. You know why? Well, man, you know, it when all things are said and done, it, you know, and and after we influence whoever we influence on in our life, if we haven't influenced our families, what do we have? And Cornelius was a man who was who had it together enough to where this wasn't simply a public display of piety. This was a reality that his whole family understood and also embraced. And also, you know how it is, you know how tricky it is passing on this kind of stuff to your kids. And everything that happened with all of that, well, he was successful, and it wasn't just his kids, it was his whole household, so any servants that he had also shared in this. So he's a pretty great guy in, in, in so many ways. It's difficult for us to grasp, again, I think the impassable gulf between Jewish and Gentile in that day. But here's a, here's a Gentile individual who truly understood that there's a God in heaven and, I, and I'm going to have to deal with him in some way. And the best way that I know how right now is, is to do it in the form of Judaism as it's being practiced here in Caesarea. I'm going to say no to the, to the gods of my fathers Jupiter, all the, other, all the other pantheon of the Roman and Greek gods. I'm going to say no to that. that that's, that's not where I, it, this makes more sense to me. Now, with that in mind, we're set up for what happens next. Third point is this. God directs the action for the advance of the gospel. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon who is a tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among them, those who attended him, Having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So again, let's break this down a little bit. Ninth hour is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Full sunlight, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. As far as we know, he had not been drinking or taking any other sort of hallucinogenic drug. He was fully, probably praying because 3 o'clock in the afternoon was the time of prayer if you were a devout Jewish individual. So that's likely what he was doing. Then the phrase is important. Again, in the middle of the day, and it says that Cornelius saw, how do he see? Clearly, in a vision. In the Greek, the word order is different. Literally, it says, he saw in a vision, and the word clearly is set in a place of emphasis. Now, what Luke is trying to tell us with that is that whatever the vision is, he saw it clearly. This is, no, this is no half imagined thing that's going on. Cor Cornelius saw something clearly. When, by the way, when God breaks in, there's really no doubt about it. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in Scripture. There's not some mild form of pollution. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. It's pretty terrible, actually. Every time an angel or somebody else shows up in Scripture, they're, they're pretty clear about what they're seeing. And Cornelius was very clear about what he was seeing here. And... and and, and so he sees. And then the angel, and here's what's amazing. Uh, if, you, if I've lost you, come back, okay? Come back for a second. The angel, you're, are you with me? All right. Because this is really cool. What does the angel do? And angels tend to do this in Scripture, and it's pretty cool. Well, he scares Cornelius, yeah. He's in terror. But what is it? What's the first thing the angel does? 
calls him by his name. Cornelius. He knows him. I mean, saying, calling someone by their name is important today, as, as Sue mentioned, especially in a positive way. The angel knows him. Now, I, you're, <laughs> you're getting this very vivid vision of this incredible being, and the first thing the being says is, Mike, or whatever your name is, Cornelius. Cornelius can only say what you and I might say. He's stunned. He's in silence, and silence seems to be appropriate, and the only thing you can say is, what is it? And we have the word Lord here, which is probably kind of like us saying, yes, sir. What is it, sir? <laughs> what else are you going to call an angel, right? What is it, sir? Remember Paul when Jesus appeared to him in the road? Who, who are you? It says Lord, but it probably was the word sir. Who are you, sir? What is it, sir? Now, it's even more amazing. The angel tells him that God has noticed his prayers and his gifts. Isn't that great? Cornelius wasn't even, he needed more information, but he was responding to what he knew, and he's responding with all of his heart. And what the angel tells him is that Cornelius, whether or not it seems likely to you, God in heaven first of all, knows your name and told me. And he sees what you're doing. And, and what you're doing has gone up and it's like, it's like this sweet-smelling, you know, it's like smelling barbecued steak <laughs> to him. That's, by the way, that's what Israel smelled like a lot during the feast and all of that. And it's a sweet... God is noticing it. How, how, I mean, do you ever feel like nobody notices what you're doing and why in the world bother when you're serving the Lord? Serving the Lord can get pretty lonely, I've got to tell you, at times. Especially if, you're, if you, you feel like you're serving and, and week in and week out you're, you're doing stuff and you're really doing it for the Lord, but man, it sure be nice some, for somebody to say, hey, good job, I noticed what you were doing. By the way, do you know that there are people that come here like at, what, 7 o'clock every Sunday morning? Most of them are back there, and they don't listen much because they're tired. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they're, they, you know, they, they get the tent ready, they do that, the worship team's here every week. They could use some more help, too, by the way, so just a little plug for those guys. But, but you know, you're serving, and it feels like, feels like not even God notices, and in the end, what's the point? Well, this, this shows us this and in other places that God's noticing in a positive way, which it's not like he's waiting for you to do something stupid and then, you know, hitting you upside the head. He, he is he's enjoying, and, and what you're doing is being noticed by a God who loves you. And that's the cool thing about this. Now, what happens next is kind of incredible. The angel, I, I would expect, if I were God, if I were God, I would always do things differently than he seems to do it. <laughs> if I were God, I would tell the angel, whoever this angel was, once Cornelius, okay, I want you to talk to Cornelius, I want you to, and I know Peter's in Joppa, but it's 30 miles away. I want you, I want you to tell Cornelius this proclamation of the good news. I want you to tell Cornelius what, what I did when I came to earth and, and gave my life as a sacrifice for sins. I want you, because Peter's goofy. Well, I never know what Peter's going to do. Sometimes he's great, sometimes he isn't. But, you know, I want you to do it. I can rely on you. Wouldn't you do I mean, if you had guys like this, wouldn't, I, I would, that seems to make sense to me. But that's not what happened. The angel then tells Cornelius, all right, and, and it's, it's, this is, you don't expect this kind of detail in these holy visions, right? Okay. It's almost like, all right, come here. Sit down. I, have, I, I got some instructions for you. All right. You with me, Cornelius? You, okay. I want you to get some guys, and I want you to send those guys down to Joppa. It's about 30 miles. You know where it is, right? Yes, yes, I know where it is. All right, there's a guy there, <laughs> and his name is Simon. He also goes by... 
Simon Peter. It's a name Jesus gave. That's not really. Okay, it's Simon, also known as Peter. And I want you to get him. He's staying with another guy named Simon. But this guy is Simon the Tanner. He tans hides. That's why he's called a tanner. By the way, a tanner couldn't go worship at the temple in Jerusalem. You know why? Because they were touching dead bodies all the time. Peter was staying with a guy who was unclean. So this, this, and it's, this, is, this is, on, it's part of what's happening here, the transition from Jewish to Gentile. So go get this guy named Simon, called Peter. His name was Simon, called a tanner. And by the way, his house is right by the sea. Joppa's, it's a port. It was a port city. So you go, where else have you heard Joppa in the Bible? All you Bible scholars. Who went to Joppa to get away from something he was supposed to do? Jonah. Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh, which was east. He went up to Joppa, which was the only port city in Israel, to go west, about as far west as he could go. So Joppa plays into several other places in the Scripture, too. So I want, I want you to go do that. Now, does that, here, here's the point. What are we, all believers, what are we told to do by Jesus, specifically? In Matthew 28, go and make disciples. Acts chapter 1, be my witnesses. We're not told to build the church. We're not told, we're not told really to do much else, be my, go make disciples and be my witnesses. In, in doing this, God's making it clear this isn't the job of angels to go be witnesses. They're messengers. That's what the word means, angel. It means messenger. They're messengers. You and I are witnesses. Now, they're, they, they're witnesses too, but to stuff we can't know yet. Go make disciples, be my witnesses. This is Peter's job to do it, and God is going to make sure that Peter does it. And Peter is going to do it, and we're going to find in the next week, it, in kind of a humorous fashion, how Peter, how Peter does this. Again, the, the whole Jewish-Gentile thing. It is up to you and I. Angels aren't going to do it. Now, the good news is, Jesus, what did he say he's going to do? Also in Matthew, I will build my church the gates of hell will not stand in this that you know what that means no matter how goofy how weird how strange how how off base the church gets at times jesus is always going to make sure that there are enough people who truly understand what he wants us to do and who actually go do it and i hope that you and i are part of that people because that's what we're supposed to do. And that, that's the point of this passage that Jesus, and throughout all of Acts, even though they're human beings like Peter doing stuff, the Holy Spirit is at times behind the scenes, at other times right out front, making sure this stuff happens. And that's what's happening here. And so humans are called. Okay, next step as the band comes up. This was for your head today a little bit. I understand that. But I've been gone for two weeks, and I've had a lot of stuff to think about. And as you know, I like information. But, but I, what, I'm, what I hope you have gathered from this is this. Again, I don't know how you come to approach Scripture. But when Luke and when other Scripture writers talks about places and names, I want you to know that those places exist, that our faith is founded on, on history, that we're not just making this stuff up as we go. That's important for all of us to know, I think. At least it was for me as an 18-year-old kid. I needed to know that stuff. I needed to know that my faith was founded on something other than my parents believed it. And I hope you've gone through that process. If you haven't, I would invite you to go through that process. Understanding that, that our faith, while it is faith and we, and we have to exercise faith in God, God has given us places, times, events, evidence, things that have been left behind historically to go see that when Scripture writes about it, we can see, yeah, that was there and it happened. And so when it talks about angels, which is a little more difficult to believe, 
it puts it in it, it doesn't put it in some place that doesn't exist. It puts it in the context of time and space and history. So that, that angel did appear in that place called Caesarea that you saw today, and it changed the course of the gospel till it finally got to you and I here today. All right, next step for this is, is this. God desires that people will hear the gospel and have life. Who is the person in your life that is being prepared by the Holy Spirit for you to introduce to Christ? Here's the way I like to put it. Being a witness for Christ is nothing more than this. You have a friend, and this friend is, is a good friend of yours, and, and there's Jesus over here. So you simply say, take your friend, Joe, this is Jesus, Jesus, Joe. I would like you to get to know each other. Jesus, I, I love this guy, Joe, and I'd like you to meet him. And then, of course, you stay in the mix to help Joe or Joanne discover who Jesus is. And by the way, Jesus is going to be active in this process as well, so you're not alone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that there are real places like Caesarea that we can even go to today and, and we can see, yeah, that's, that's what happened and it happened right here. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are building your church and you have been building your church since the first century and you are continuing to build your church. That can give us a lot of hope. Help us to obey you in making disciples and being your witnesses and in the process being the kind of people that others can look at and say, there is a difference that is attractive with this individual. That we, would, that we would have the beauty of Jesus in our lives, but be able to speak the words of Jesus when we're called upon to do so. I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand as we close.